I am greatly honored to be selected to serve as president of this organization. I would like to thank Margie Malia and Jill Wilhite, who have done a fantastic job of managing our group and making this in-person meeting possible. <laughs> Tim Farrell, the executive director of the Southeastern Surgical Congress, has been a thoughtful colleague who has worked tirelessly addressing challenge after challenge facing the Southeast and Surgical Congress over the term of my presidency. I would also like to thank John Potts and John Mellinger for talking to me about the state of American surgical residency training in the United States as I prepared this talk. A big thanks to Ken Sharp who introduced me to the Southeastern Surgical Con Congress. He has been a great colleague and an inspiration for me. Thanks to everyone that has served on the committees, the committee chairs, the executive council members, the executive committee members, the volunteers on committees of the Southeastern Surgical Congress, the editors of our journal, and the membership for making this in-person meeting possible and doing everything we can to make the Southeastern Surgical Congress a big success. I would also like to acknowledge the faculty, residents, program coordinators, administrative staff at the University of South Alabama who have supported me and every day make me proud to be at USA. If you have been trained by USA, or they're training now, or part of USA, please stand up. My parents have always been loving, supportive parents, and my mom still believes that I am perfect. I am so proud of my children, Nicole, Haley, and Kendall. They are my most important accomplishment of my life. I love my stepdaughters, Sarah and Rachel, and I'm looking forward to be a grandfather. Most of all, 14 years ago, Betsy changed my life for the better. I would not be standing here if not for her support. She has made my personal life as rewarding and happy as my professional. The year I spent as a fellow in portal hypertension working under the direction of Dr. Dean Warren left an indelible mark on my life and career as a surgeon. He taught core principles of surgery, such as do the right thing for the patient, the importance of constantly evaluating results, and the need for clinical research. Dr. Warren's presidential address to the American Surgical Association, not for the profession, for the people, detailed his belief that the leaders of American surgery were doing the right thing to close substandard residency programs in order to improve surgical care for the average American, i.e., for the people. The general surgical resident has to develop competency in patient care, medical knowledge, professionalism, communication skills, practice-based learning, and systems-based practice in order to independently practice surgery. Surgical training was changed completely for the better by two seminal events, the formation of the Independent Residency Review Committee under the auspices of the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, ACGME, in 1981 
and also the implementation of work hour restrictions for residents in 2003. I will argue that the work hour restrictions mandated in 2003 were essential to improve the well-being and the training of surgical residents, thus for the people and the profession. It's been almost 20 years since residency training was profoundly changed with the mandate for resident work hour restrictions and 40 years since the formation of the independent residency review committee. What have we observed? What has gotten better or gotten worse? And what can be done to perpetuate the improvements that started in 1981? The problem with American training programs circa 1970 to 1981, there were many severely substandard programs at the time of the formation of the independent RRC. The substandard programs had unpaid faculty who showed little evidence of scholarly work and could not attract qualified residents. There was an astounding 46% failure rate for the qualifying or written exam that assessed knowledge of general surgical principles. And a 31% failure rate for the certifying or oral exam that assessed clinical judgment, technical knowledge, and application of knowledge to clinical problems. Two members of the Residency Review Committee, G. Tom Shires and W. Dean Warren, were determined to improve surgical training through increased standards for program accreditation. They stressed the need to match qualified medical students into residency programs and to mandate support for dedicated surgeons teaching the science and the practice of surgery. The quality and amount of scholarly activity, i.e. scientific publications by the faculty was stressed for accreditation of residency training programs. The independent RRC closed almost 100 surgical residency programs and two decades later there were only 254 accredited surgical residency programs. Pass rates for the American Board of Surgery exam increased steadily in the years after the formation of the independent RRC, from 54% pass rate to 78%. General surgical training had improved the quality of graduating residents by exacting high standards for the program director, the faculty, and the residents. Surgical training circa 1981 to 2003 was characterized by every other or every third night being on call, which resulted in residents routinely logging 100 to 136 hours in a 168-hour week. In many ways, surgical residency was like Navy SEAL team training, where during Hell Week, the candidates are allowed only four hours of sleep, while for 20 hours per day they are pushed to the limit in their physical and mental abilities. The difference between surgical training and SEAL team training was that Hell Week for the surgical resident was at least five years in length. Libby Zion, a freshman in college, was admitted to a New York teaching hospital with a flu-like ailment and cared for by two junior medical residents, but never examined by the attending physician. They prescribed medications to control jerking motions and ordered physical restraints. Over the next 12 hours, her temperature soared to 107 degrees Fahrenheit and ended with cardiac arrest secondary to serotonin syndrome induced by the interaction of her prescribed antidepressant and the medications ordered by the residents. Her father, Sidney Zion, a journalist from the New York Times, pursued lawsuits against the residents and lobbied for changes in resident education. He said, 
you do not need kindergarten to know that a resident working a 36-hour shift is in no condition to make any kind of judgment call. Forget about life and death. Prompted in part by the untimely death of Libby Zion and the resulting public outcry, the ACGME in 2003 adopted regulations for restricted work hours for all U.S. accredited residencies. Training programs shifted to a night and day shift with increased attending supervision. Work hour restrictions were needed to fix the excessive call, improve resident wellness, and therefore were essential to foster an improved, more humane training environment for the people and the profession. Initially, work hour limitations had mixed effects. Not surprisingly, they reduced the time surgical residents spent in the hospital environment by six to 12 months. And this reduction occurred primarily at times when residents had more autonomy and had exposure to emergency cases. Ten years after the work hour restrictions were implemented, a survey of fellowship program directors identified major deficits in operative autonomy, responsibility, and scholarly focus in general surgical graduates that could be attributed in part to the work hour limitations. Shockingly, they identified that 30 percent of these new graduates could not independently perform laparoscopic cholecystectomy, a core general surgical procedure. Practicing Southeastern Surgical Congress surgeons who had hired a new partner trained under the duty hour restrictions assessed their new partner's readiness for independent practice. Only 18% of the new graduates were deemed to be able to operate independently on the first day of practice. The senior partners had to train the newly trained surgeon to operate independently. The American Board of Surgery's certifying exam assesses clinical judgment, technical knowledge, and application of knowledge to clinical problems. Failure rates had plummeted from 31% in 1980 to 14% in 2003 after the RRC had axed those underperforming programs. But after imposition of the work hours restrictions, the failure rate climbed to a high of 25% in 2011. It was clear that changes in resident training had to be adopted to create competent surgeons for the people. In 2004, the Surgical Council on Resident Education, otherwise known as SCORE, was formed to improve the education of surgical residents through a national curriculum focused on the six competencies of GME patient care, medical knowledge, professionalism, interpersonal and communication skills, practice-based learning, systems-based practice. Mandatory attendance in this week in SCORE was shown to improve resident American Board of Surgery in training exam scores in this study. This national curriculum has enabled surgical residents to acquire knowledge needed for competency in general surgery, as evidenced by the steady increase in pass rates for the qualifying exam from 2003 when the work hour restrictions were mandated. SCORE has been a major positive step in, towards improving resident education, but it has to be directed by dedicated faculty. It is critical to the maturation of the resident into a fully independent practitioner to be able to develop more autonomy despite restricted work hours. Resident programs, including ours, have developed a service managed by chief residents with attending supervision, resulting in increases in teaching assistant cases, where the chief resident supervises 
a junior level resident performing surgery. This has been associated with increased resident autonomy and satisfaction with operative case variety. The independent chief resident service has also been able to create case volume and a case mix similar to the first year of practice, found to be very helpful by the graduating residents. Laparoscopic surgery requires skills that are very different from open surgery, and resident participation, particularly in laparoscopic cases, markedly increases operative time. Surgeons must increasingly prepare for technical skills outside of the OR in the simulation center. To be effective, the simulation must be directed by dedicated faculty and methods for measuring skills are used to ensure adequate skills are acquired before the trainees operate on patients. This study shows that surgical skills can be improved with repeated simulations. Our experience at USA, University of South Alabama, has been to foster competitions that make it fun and an environment that is friendly and encouraging. Dr. Rodney was a unique surgeon at USA who was an inspiration for faculty and residents. How can the faculty best teach technical surgery? Dual task interference occurs when the mental processing needed to perform one task interferes with the mental ability to complete a concurrent task. The inexperienced resident concentrating on one task in the OR cannot recognize what the attending is asking them to do. The laparoscopic colorectal surgery training the trainer curriculum has a six-point framework for interop teaching. The first and most effective is stop and prompt the trainee to pause so that they have more mental capacity to fully understand the discussion of the next steps. Utilizing this technique aims to improve interoperative teaching by removing this dual task interference. How does a resident prepare and pass a 90-minute American Board of Surgery certifying oral exam given by two experienced surgeons covering the broad depth of general surgery? One way to prepare for the certifying exam is to go over numerous scenarios and then to practice in mock oral exams. Sequential participation as a PGY 4 and 5 in mock oral exams has been shown to improve pass rates, but required 80 hours of administrative time to develop the scenarios, prepare the session, and generate the formal evaluations. The volunteer faculty in this study spent 180 hours in orientation, administering the exam, and debriefs. The Southeastern Surgical Congress this past year participated in a mock oral exam with the Southwestern Surgical Congress. It was an amazing exercise to prepare surgical residents to be able to answer the questions and also how to approach surgical patients posed to them in this 90-minute exam. Failure rates for the American Board of Surgery certifying oral exam fell from 31% in 1976 to 14% by 2003. After imposition of the duty hour restrictions, failure rates rose to a high of 25% in 2011, likely in large part due to the institut institution of the work hour restrictions. The institution of mock oral exams administered by faculty and greater emphasis on education has resulted in decreases in the failure rate to its current level of 15%. Dr. 
Dr. Warren argued in his presidential address that high standards for the programs, faculty, and residents were essential to allow the average American to receive competent surgical care. Resident work hour restrictions created a better training environment by reducing fatigue and promoting well-being for the resident and their families. Improvements to general surgical education continue to evolve, and I recommend that our surgical training programs adopt the following. First, hire faculty who are good surgeons, who are committed to education and excellence in the surgical care of the patient. Financially support and incentivize faculty educational efforts. Reward only for work RVUs disincentivizes educational activities of the faculty. Three, create resident-run services to create resident autonomy and develop skills needed to independently practice. Four, optimize educational efforts through simulation, serial mock exams, conferences attended by faculty, improve OR teaching using modern education techniques, teach research methods and critical thinking and analysis of data. Work with your sponsoring institution to support the educational mission, which by training competent independent practitioners benefits the institution, the profession, and the people. General surgery is a great specialty. The work hour restrictions have created a much better environment for learning to be a surgeon, but it takes dedicated faculty using the new and better methods to produce competent surgeons. Demand excellence, reward the educators, work hard to optimize resident education, and demonstrate to the sponsoring institution of the value in educating good surgeons. After all, these changes are for the people and the profession. Thank you, it's been a great honor to be your president over this last 18 months, and I just thank you so much for being involved in the Southeastern Surgical Congress, and thank you all for your attendance. Uh, it's, it's my privilege to present to uh, Bill this plaque from the Southeastern Surgery Congress to uh, William O. Richards, President, 2020 to 2021. And we thank him from the Southeastern and me personally for taking an extra six months for his year and a half of work. Thank you very much.